And I want to talk to you about something that's very important in your business and in your life and, and, and honestly, very important in your leadership. And that is the ability to develop emotional intelligence. Um, and, and emotional intelligence is all about having the ability to, to, to receive um, and to manage and, and to regulate your emotions. Um, what I've learned about leadership is that there are some people that they lead very well. But they don't have what I would call the emotional strength, the emotional stamina to honestly stay in the game. And they're not, they're not leaving the game of, of leadership, and they're not quitting because they, they're a poor leader. They just don't have the ability to um, emotionally handle, I don't know, the weight of the responsibility of leadership itself. And so, you know, Daniel uh, Goleman wrote the great book on emotional intelligence. If you've not read that book, that is certainly one that you want to spend some time with. I, I think it is the uh, breakthrough book in, in how to do well and, and, and to carry this, this incredible um, inner emotional lead, need, uh, lead, need that we have to, to lead very, very well. But Daniel, in his book on emotional intelligence, he talks about five key elements that make up emotional intelligence. And I want to pass this on to you because he's taught me much about this, and I'm now wanting to obviously teach you about it also. So the first key element of emotional intelligence is self-awareness. And um, wow. In fact, I have I have in the studio today a, a book that just came out. I just literally wrote it and it came out in the last uh, few weeks. And and it's 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 about the self-aware leader. And, and Daniel Goldman says that if you're going to be emotionally intelligent, you have to be very self-aware. You you need to see yourself not as uh you think you are, but as you really are. You know, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality, and that reality kind of begins with me self-assessing and knowing who I really am. I wrote a book called The 15 Laws of Growth, and in that book, I, I have this statement, you can't grow yourself unless you know yourself. I have just discovered without any question that you can't fix what you don't know. So in my life, if I have, quote, blind spots— about me, that unless somebody comes into my life and makes me aware of those, honestly, I'll probably operate my whole life with these gaps, these holes that that will never allow me to reach my full potential. So uh, maybe the most important awareness of a leader is self-awareness, so that if I can be self-aware and know myself well, I can lead myself well, and then I can I can lead other people well, obviously. The second uh, key element of, of uh, emotional intelligence is self-regulation. Now, this is all about me managing me. You've heard me talk about, I think, the, the most difficult leadership that I ever do is not leading you. It's leading me. That, that's where the challenge comes in. Uh, it's easy to tell you what to do. It's not easy for me to do what I know I should do. Self-regulation is all about me uh, disciplining my life and being self-aware in my life enough to be able to do the things that I should do, not the things I want to do. Again, emotional intelligence gives me the ability to do what is right above what feels good. So self-regulation, self-awareness, these are two key elements in emotional intelligence. And then the third area is motivation. Uh, emotionally intelligent people not only are self-regulated and self-aware, but they know what motivates them. And what motivates them is how they continue doing great work. For example, I, I, I know what motivates me, and that is uh, helping people improve their life. When I add value to you in your life, it begins to be quite amazing the reward that I receive from it. You see, I've already been personally successful in life, and I've had a lot of wonderful wins. But when I can help you get a win under your belt, when I can help you be successful, when I can help you grow, when I can help you develop, all of a sudden, that's what motivates me. I'm motivated by your growth. 
Emotionally intelligent people know what is fulfilling in their life. They know what is encouraging to them, what nourishes them, what gives them energy to continue on. So I want to encourage you as we're talking about these five key elements of social intelligence and emotional intelligence, I want to encourage you to um, ask yourself, what, what motivates me? What keeps me in the game? What, what keeps me passionate about what I do? The fourth key element of uh, emotional uh, intelligence is empathy. The ability to see people and to feel what they feel and to emotionally share with them how much you care for them. This is very important for you to be able to come along people on your team and have empathy toward them. I, I, the expression that I, I've said for many years that I'm kind of well known for is people really don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Well, that's what empathy is all about. Empathy is all about taking time to care enough to ask questions, to listen well, and to let that person know that you're here for them and that you want to add value to them and you want to make a difference in their lives. That's huge. So again, Daniel Goleman in his great book, Emotional Intelligence, gives us these five key elements. Number one, self-awareness. Number two, self-regulation. Number three, motivation. Number four, empathy. And then number five, good social skills. The reason good social skills are so essential is that our emotions drive our behavior. And especially our emotions drive our behavior with people. <coughs> In other words, we see people not as they are. We see people as we are. So when I see you, I, I, I see you but I see you through the lens of me. And so what that means in, in, in emotional intelligence is if I value myself, I can add value to you. If I love myself, I can love you. If I want to invest in myself, I can invest in you. In other words, how I see me is how I see you. And emotionally intelligent people see themselves in a healthy way, which determines they see people in a healthy way. Perspective is so key to this. And, and what I've discovered is how I view things is how I do things. And so when I view you as a person with potential, I'll invest in you. And that's why we're doing these mentoring times together. Emotions create a tail wagging the dog scenario. Mary Shelley says, nothing is so painful to the human mind as a great, as a great and sudden change. I think that's probably really true. And because of change and the sudden change and the blind side and things that we don't see coming, we begin to be incredibly emotional. So get the point again. The observation is very simple. Emotions create a tail wagging the dog scenario. I love Mary Shelley's quote. I, I, I put a quote kind of behind that that I think just kind of ties into it. And it's a very simple quote. Emotional strength is revealed during a crisis. You see, when a crisis comes, we find out what people have on the inside. How emotionally strong am I when things are not going well? I, we can all be emotionally strong when things are going our way. We all have that. But, but during a crisis, things don't go our way. and We get surprised. We get blindsided. Things happen that we don't like. And all of a sudden, we find out what we are on the inside as far as emotional stability and strength. I'm telling leaders every time I'm teaching now that this is the time on your team to find out who your players are and who your pretenders are. Because trust me, if you're leading a team, you've got some pretenders. You've got some people that really look good when things are going good, but they don't look good when things are going bad. You know why? They're not emotionally strong on the inside. And what, what leaders are finding all over the country and around the world right now, as they're looking and finding the players and the pretenders, what they're finding is that there are a lot, a lot of their staff 
instead of being a leader and helping lift the load, by the way, leaders lift, leaders lift the load, instead of lifting the load because they're not emotionally strong themselves, they're part of the load. They're bogging things down. They're asking the same questions that followers are asking, and they're going through emotions that are debilitating to their leadership. So the adjustment that we need to make with this kind of an observation, the adjustment we need to make is that leaders need to develop emotional strength. And I go back to Tom Morris's Plato's Lemonade Stand, but now I'm sure you're going to get the book. Great book. Here's what Tom Morris says about stability. Imagine life as a big wagon wheel. If we emotionally live on the outer rim, then as the wheel turns, we are spun around to extreme highs and lows in rapid and dizzying succession. Why? Because we're on the outer rim. Everything is exaggerated in our life. So leaders that are out on the outer rim, they're emotionally unstable also. So what's Tom say? But if we can learn, I love this phrase, if we can learn to move closer to the midpoint of the hub, in other words, get to the middle of that wheel, we become much more centered and the wheel will spin. In fact, it spins as much as it always has, but we won't be so dramatically thrown about by its motion. And I put right in the book, uh, on his Lemonade Stand book, I put right in the book, leaders need to live near the midpoint of the hub. And so my advice to every one of you out there, if you're on a a leadership team, you need to ask yourself the very simple question, am I helping lift the load or am I adding to the load? If you're leading a staff, I'm I'm saying to you leaders, you got to look at every one of your team players. You got to ask yourself, are they lifting? Are they helping me? Are they making things better around here or are they part of the problem? It's like when I was leading as a pastor of a large church in San Diego, and I'd have staff members bring me issues and problems. And one day I thought, you know what? Any person can find a problem. Any person can find an issue. I don't mean this unkindly. You don't have to be smart to find out a problem. Hello? So I looked at him and I said, we're going to change things. When you bring a problem, it's okay because we have problems. We have to deal with them. We're not trying to be the ostrich and hide her head under the sand. But when you bring me a problem, bring me three solutions, three ways that you think that problem can be fixed. And by the way, one of the three that you bring, you're part of the solution. In other words, you're saying, we have a problem and I think I could help you here. I can tell you that immediately changed the mindset of my team and my staff. Why? It's very simple. I was teaching them to be emotionally solid and stable. I did a teaching um, a few months back and I closed with this on emotionally strong leaders because I can promise you right now in this crisis needed more than anything else is emotional stability and strength among leaders. And sadly, sadly, I was explaining to someone the other day when I was teaching during this entire uh, period of darkness that we've been in, I am what I call leadership sad. I'm, I'm just leadership sad. I'm a, I'm, I, I'm a positive person and I try to always uh, be up for people and smile. But on the inside, I'm very leadership sad. And I'm leadership sad because, not not because of all the issues and the problems and the people. It's because of the leaders. The leaders, we're not stepping up. And we're not stepping up because we, we lack strong emotional core. And so I said, uh, uh, when I did this lesson, really I did it a couple years ago on emotionally strong leaders, I said the following six things. I give them to you quickly in closing. Emotionally strong leaders, number one, do not waste time feeling sorry for themselves. You can't moan and lead at the same time. Figure it out, would you please? Does anybody want to follow up a moaning, groaning leader? I don't. You don't. None of us do. Make a choice. Are you going to be part of the problem or are you going to be part of the solution? Are you going to moan or are you going to grow? Number two, emotionally strong leaders do not allow themselves to be controlled by others. 
Now, they walk slowly through the crowd. They listen. They respect people's opinions. There's a difference between me asking questions, respecting your opinion, listening to you, and letting you control how I lead. You see, you either you either lead or 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 you you lead or be led. Just lead or be led. That's just how simple it is. Number three, emotionally strong leaders embrace changes and challenges. In fact, to be honest with you, leaders are just a little bit weird here. When there's a problem, they just kind of start living and breathing to a higher level. And it, it just excites them because they've got a, a challenge in front of them. They, they love mountains. They just give me a mountain and, and let me figure out how to get myself and my team to climb it. Number four, emotionally strong leaders do not worry about pleasing others. They want to serve others. They want to help others. But a long time ago, as a young leader, I realized that I was called to be a leader, not a clown. So my goal isn't to always make you happy. I, 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 I learned a long time ago that if I just make you happy, I can't help you. In fact, I learned also that if you need people, if you need their affirmation, you need people to say, oh, you're just wonderful, or oh, we couldn't do without you, all that stuff that's so ridiculous. If you need people, you really can't lead people. You have to be able to rise above the emotions of others because it's, they're really raw right now. And, and you need to be stronger on, on the inside. A, a, a leader that can't rise emotionally above the people that he or she is trying to lead is just going to take them all on an emotional train wreck. I promise you. I promise you. Number four or number five, emotionally strong leaders do not expect immediate results or answers. There's no quick fix. So when people are always asking me, well, make a quick statement. This happened. Make a statement. I'm looking at them and saying, excuse me, a statement isn't going to make a difference. Now, there are ways to make a difference. But emotionally strong leaders realize there's just no quick fix. It's a lot deeper and deserves more than just a statement. And finally, emotionally strong people are not led by their emotions. They're led by their values. They're led by their calling. They're led by their principles. I can tell you what they're led by, but their emotions, no, no. There are many times as a leader, emotionally, I want to do something that I didn't do because I understood that I had a higher calling and I needed to go to a higher level than what the emotional world would allow me to live in and walk in. So, Mark, my, my first question of discussion with you is, you know, John lays out in this episode um, where he says he gives us five people, you know, and he goes through and talks about each one of these. We often talk about uh, as leaders that we should be the same person we are personally as we are professionally. We shouldn't have these different um, personas that we show up with and who who you really are. How do you go about as a leader? Um how do you go about making sure that you are continually, because it's not something we just do one time, that we've got to have continual self, self-awareness. What, maybe what processes, what systems, what things do you have in check that allow you to become and or learn from a self-awareness about your leadership right now in your journey? Well, uh, I, huh. I, think, I, I think the biggest thing, just to lay the groundwork of my answer, I, I think there's a couple of things. I go back to another quote, uh, Veronica Tuglavia says, to know yourself, you must sacrifice the illusion that you already do. Mm. Now think about that. We got to be self-aware, but to be self-aware, we got to give up the fact that we're self-aware. Yes. It reminds me of what yeah. John teaches about blind spots. Mm. He says, man, you've heard a lot of people. It's not just John, but we got to know our blind spots. Reveal my blind spots. Reveal my blind spots. And then somebody tells you something you don't see in yourself and you discredit it because you can't see it. Well, it's a blind spot, which means you can't see it, leader. It's blind. You're blind. You can't see it. Well, in this concept of what do I do to become self-aware? Let me tell you the biggest thing I'm going to give you in what I do to be self-aware. I ask others what it's like to be on the other side of me. Love it. That's the biggest thing. How can I be self-aware? I'm pretty comfortable with myself. I don't feel like I'm egocentric. My wife gives me some feedback that's otherwise to that at times. I don't feel egocentric, but I will tell you this. All of us have a little bit of self-ego. 
We all have a little self-righteousness. We all have a little bit too inflated self-esteem at times. Even the most lowly, introverted, woe is me individual at times feels like a, a God, if you will, a little small G-O-D, a God to themselves. Because we live with ourselves. We know ourselves. We know our heart. We know when our heart doesn't match our mind. We know when we're misunderstood. We know what we are and what we're not. So to become self-aware so that we can be more effective, the biggest thing I can tell you is to ask people around you. One of the hardest things for me to do, Chris, and I don't subscribe to having many people like this, But I believe every one of us should have someone in our life whose opinion of us matters more than our opinion of ourselves. Check this out, because I believe in self-esteem. I believe in not letting other people define us. I believe all of that psychology that I believe is legit. But when it it comes to being a self-aware leader, I believe somebody around you that is more trusted than anyone else in your life should be able to speak into you and what they say and think should be given more credibility than what you think about Mm. yourself. Mm. Now, leaders, I know I'm disrupting so much of your thinking there, but for me, Mr. Dogmatic, emphatic, ready to go, self-contained, very certain of myself leader, I have found most often times I'm not aware of myself because I don't live on the other side of me. I live inside of me. Yeah. Hey, uh, listeners, the, the last three minutes of Mark's comments is pure gold in regards to self-awareness. I started thinking, Mark, about your comments as you were talking. And I was like, you know, as if we don't go outside or we don't ask the proper questions of ourselves and we say, why am I feeling that way? Why do I do this? Well, we're biased. So all we're doing is we're reaffirming why we feel the way we feel. We're telling us that story versus asking the question of what, what about that situation makes me act this way? So we need to be thinking about that question of, of what in order to get to the root cause versus the why. And then to Mark's point, having people speak into your life in regards to what does it look like to be on the other side of my leadership? And Mark started off this lesson by quoting John with the mic drop that said, then we have to be willing to change. Mm-hmm. So in order for you to, to be able to, to understand where you're being on the other side of people's leadership, then are you willing to change that? I think that's pure gold. I do too. You know, Chris, I I was thinking, and I have not developed this. uh, For those of you that are in the John Maxwell team and hear me teach every Tuesday, you'll hear this soon. But just as I was talking about self-awareness and self-confidence, there are very few things that are non-negotiable that people external of me can speak into with greater clarity than I can. And let me give you two that comes to mind at the top of the mind. My vision, or let me give you three. My vision, because it should be my vision, and vision cannot be deterred by people that can't see more, more, and more before. So I don't let people... I don't let people challenge the vision that I see in my prayer time, in my quiet time, in my envisioning time. I, that, that's got to be mine, and I'm tasked to see more and before. My purpose what I was designed to do. I'll let people speak into it, but I get the final say. The other, the third thing that I can think of off the top of my head, and I'm going to start doing some work on this just because this podcast is really firing me up, is my intent. Mm. What my heart and my intent was. Now I'll let people speak to the way I come across, my conduct, my, my intensity, the fact that I'm wrong on the color scheme of something that we're supposed to do. I, I'll let a lot of people speak into most everything else. But on those three things, I feel like they have to come from internal. But the self-aware leader has very few things that he or she tests from the inside. Most of our self-awareness should be tested with, with, with trusted sources on the outside. Yeah, I totally uh, agree with that. And, and I think when you have what we call the inner circle, 
and you have even a tighter circle than that that can speak into that. You, we all leaders, listen, we all work at a pace. We all play at a pace. We live at a pace that we become uh, almost, um, a, a, we, we don't even recognize how we're leading. And so we have to have somebody, we got to set up a system and a process to be able to do that. Now, John goes into his lesson and he gives us these four, these four points. He says, the consistency of, of your leadership. He talks about being open and transparent talks about your willingness to address your weaknesses and then understanding your values. What you just unpacked for us in regards to the, the three things that you don't let other people speak into outside of that, you are open to that, I think lays out really, really well and aligns with these four things. You, yeah. you got to be open to it. You got to be able to uh, address it and change it. You know and understand your values. But one thing that we don't talk about that I would just like for you to kind of share your thoughts on is the consistency part. With all of your work with high level leaders, other organizations with John on the road, what is it about leaders and their consistency as a leader that shows that there's self-awareness there? Well, Chris, I, I think about conversations we have about your son, Ryland. He's a D1 athlete. I think when, when, I'm, when you're asking that question, I think about a conversation I had with Macy this morning as I was driving her to school. Again, for those of you visually joining us today, I've been traveling a lot. So Chris and I are Zooming to get some podcasts in because we got some Thank things sure. in our heart that we want to share. And so I'm domesticated this week. I'm very domesticated. I won't go into that, but I'm very domesticated. And, um, and so this morning I got to take my daughter to school which is after I picked her up yesterday, which when I picked her up yesterday, my daughter is super exhausted. I mean, just wore out. And so I talked with Macy on the, on the drive home and she had church that she wanted to go to small group last night. She had several things that she wanted to do. We're in the middle of some quarantine, another story for another day here from, from uh, the, the true queen of the house. And so I was driving her home. She said, dad, I just don't know how I'm going to be able to do all this. And I'm just wore out. Mm. I was concerned that she was sick. So I got her a COVID test and some stuff and she wasn't. And I said, uh, Macy, I think what you need to do is you need to just go to sleep. Now to tell Macy, my daughter to take a nap in the middle of the day is like telling me to take a nap in the middle of the day. It is a foreign language. Yeah. But she did it. She came home at four 30 yesterday and she slept until nine o'clock last night. Wow. We were recapping that. Now, Chris, my daughter is not uh, of the size and stature of your son, but they share something in common. They're extremely consistent. My daughter works hard to, make, to be at the top of her school. She works very hard at it, very hard, and she cares about it. And so this morning, she began this self-talk of saying, Dad, I just was lazy last night. I was mm. negligent. I just didn't challenge. I just, I just didn't push through. And I did get my homework done. I didn't sleep much last night. But I just feel like that I just was not very good last night. Here's what I had to do with my daughters. The same thing I know you've had to do with Ryland recently. You pull them back from the blinders they have on about the frustration of the moment and you remind them of the body of work they have exhibited all of their life because it rests in this first point John makes on self-awareness. Who are you as a leader consistently demonstrating yourself to be? Don't take a bad moment. Don't take a bad business decision. Don't take a failed financial and determine the scope of your leadership. Take the body of your leadership. And what I was telling Macy this morning, what, I, what you tell Rylan often, what I tell you leaders, podcast listeners, is look at the body of work in your leadership and take that as the thing you need to be self-aware of, not the fact my daughter slept four and a half hours in the middle of the evening, which is so uncharacteristic of her. That's not the body of her work. So don't, don't become judgmental or self-aware on something that is for a moment. Be self-aware of the things that are consistent good. about your leadership. Yeah, that's so good. And I think when you speak into Macy, uh, maybe one of your team members, and you're able to talk about the big picture of that, that allows them to see over time how truly self-aware they are. Right. And I think that, I think that's incredibly awesome. Now, let me, let me ask you this question. 
So as you work with leaders and organizations, and we talk about this, one of the one of the things I think it's very important to be consistent and self aware is John talks about the lens principle, mm -hmm. and it and isn't it true? Now again, we're uh, we're 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 blending the internal and external self awareness in this conversation. We're going kind of back and forth, but both are so extremely important that we see others as 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 we see ourselves. And I think if we are jaded and we're not aware truly of ourselves, I think we have that same interpretation of other people. And you mentioned in your description just a few minutes ago, you mentioned about your intent. And I think we've mentioned this before in this podcast. There's a, we, we call it the intent versus perception gap. And, and we get into this mode as leaders. Talk about the lens principle and the power of that in regards to self-awareness. Well, so Chris, I'm a very, I, I feel like, again, we might need to do a poll to see if I'm self-aware about this. I feel like a pretty positive and passionate person. I, that would be I feel, true. I, I feel like, thank you. That makes yeah. me feel like I am a little check. bit aware. Yeah, check. Does that mean I have negative moments or does that mean I don't have negative moments? No, I, I do have negative moments, but I have people around me that when I'm just a little more gnarly, a little more negative, a little more pessimistic than normal, they call me out on it and go, whoa, wait, you are beginning to entrench yourself into challenge and negativity. And that's not who you are. But I just like every leader listening to this podcast today, I am tempted with being more judgmental of myself than I am of those around me. Mm -hmm. Isn't it true that we as leaders, not as parents, because we, we get a little hard on our kids sometimes because we want to live our, the life we wish we would have lived through our kids. Yeah. So it, I'm not applying to parents necessarily here. There's some of this that does. But as leaders, many of us have a greater propensity to give grace to those around us more than we give grace to ourselves. What I had to tell Macy last night is, Macy, you are not a lazy girl. You have one of the strongest work ethics. I've only woken her up in her life twice that I can remember. She is consistent about her responsibilities. Well, I'm not a negative person, but there are times that I feel negative and I have people around me that goes, hey, wake up. You are not being true to who you really are because self-awareness is not only knowing yourself as I quoted uh, Socrates just a moment ago, knowing yourself, or excuse me, being self-aware is also staying true to what you already know. I know that I am best when I am positively and, and passionately sharing vis vision and hope for the future. So when I have meetings that are overbearing with the frustrations of the day and not laced with hopeful aspirations of tomorrow, I have people that text me, call me and go, hey, dude, you OK? Today felt a little more challenging than what you normally are. I'm thankful for those moments because self-awareness is not just knowledge of myself. It is consistency that I stay true to what I know about myself. Yeah. And the reason I asked Mark this question, even just to unpack it for us a little bit with consistency is, uh, I believe that is a, a leadership trait, a leadership competency that is not talked about enough. And I think it fits into this, this uh, self-awareness. So maybe a listener that is listening right now says, hey, I love the question of what's it look like to be on the other side of my leadership, but I don't lead anybody. And here's what I was thinking. And I'm going to throw it back to you and let you wrap it up, but but a, a closing action or a thought that I had when you were telling that story about Macy is I know Macy, obviously not as well as you do, okay? And um, I would think nothing of the fact that she took a four hour nap yesterday, doesn't change my perspective of, of her. It does internally change her, uh, how she feels. So maybe maybe your challenge as you're listening to us this week is, is you don't have people that report directly to you and you can't ask the question that Mark posed. So then maybe you go around and John gave us the five people in the beginning of this lesson, who you are, who you think you are. Maybe you can write some, down some notes, but then what I want to encourage you to do is to go to your family, to go to your friends and to go to your acquaintances and say, who do you think I am? How, how do I come across? It's not maybe a leadership question, but ultimately it's a self-awareness question. And so I just want to challenge everybody, whether you're leading people 
or what we would call your influencing people, which we all have influence, that you have the ability to get that feedback that Mark is talking about that allows you to become more self-aware. So Mark, take that, wrap wrap us up for the day around self-awareness. I, I love that, Chris, because uh, so, some of you are entrepreneurs. You're solo entrepreneurs. I mean, you're in the thick of starting something and you feel extraordinarily alone. Number one, you're not. Chris and I, our team, our staff, are right here with you. And we look forward to meeting you every Wednesday, hopefully just like you look forward to meeting us. We're in it with you. We're in it for you. So don't don't allow that voice to make you feel too alone. Are you trying something that's lonely, that's trying something without others right now? Yeah. But all of us need to, every one of us, even you solo entrepreneur listening right now by yourself, you still need to get into relationship. Find somebody, even you that are out there that are in the most lonely, self-oriented place you've ever been in your life, you still need to find somebody to help you be self-aware. The second thing that I would say, just in wrapping this up, Chris, is take to heart what everyone says. I say this quote all the time. I'll say it again today. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. When it comes to your self-awareness, you should always be in the student position. If you are too busy telling people who you are rather than discovering who you are yourself, you are too self-absorbed. You need to show people who you are, not tell them who you are, and you need to discover who you are rather than think you've already arrived. And our challenge to you in this episode is to do that, to put yourself in a student position, a learning position to discover who you are. We dive in. Your influence is showing up again on John in this book. John John gives us five (laughs) keys, five keys to uh, be aware of, to consider as we begin thinking about connecting with people. Number one is realize you are not the main attraction. What is going on with that? The entire population of the world, with one small exception, is composed of other people right. and not just about you. And it goes back to even just the illustration I shared just a minute ago about that young communicator coming up to John and being like, man, I can't wait to tell him what I what I got to tell him and, and about me. And it's not about you. Hmm. You are not the main attraction. And you need to realize that as a communicator. Man, oh, man. Was this a tough lesson for me? Uh, probably, boy, 10, 12, 15 years ago, I was traveling with a, a, a guy. Uh, many of you may know Dr. Jack Zinger. He's written mm. many books. He yeah. He's a rock star in the space, uh, um, human development. He's just fantastic. But he invited me to speak. and It was like the biggest honor for me. But on like the third night of a five-night speaking uh, trip, he said, Do you, when are, can you tell a difference on when you're on and when you when you don't have it, when you're off on the stage, can you? Feel, I, I thought that we were going to have a, you know, he was going to share. What about me? I thought he was some lesson, but he said, I said, yeah. Uh, there are times I can tell when I've got it, when I don't. He goes, you may tell you the difference, and I said, yeah. What? <laughs> he said, when on the on the nights when you feel like you're off, like you didn't have it, uh, I've noticed that you were completely focused on you yourself. Mm. You're completely focused wow. on how you look, how you sound. Do I sound smart? Do I look good? Is my tie straight? Uh, do people, are, are people impressed with me? And I was starting to, you know, backtrack a little bit. What? And he goes, but on the nights you're on, I've noticed that you're completely focused on what That's you so can good. give to the audience. And I went, well, I didn't thought about it. I actually, I, re- I rejected it and argued a little bit. But then I thought about it later and go, he's exactly right. I have made it about me, and I'm worried about how I look. And I was sweat- sweating and nervous and anxious. But the minute I started adopting this little lesson he gave me, which was make it about the other person mm-hmm. or make it about the group or make it about the audience, uh, And don't worry, do I want them to think I look good? Yes, but that's not why I'm here. Do I want them to think I sound smart? Yes, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here to add value to you, to give you some nugget of truth that you can leave here and be better after having been with me. And once I got that, I stopped sweating. I stopped being nervous. I started going in, kind of kind of meditating over the empty seats about who's going to be sitting here, who's who's going to be thinking about the groups that we coach. What do they need? What are they looking for? How can I help them? The individuals that we talk to, what is this? How can I serve you? How can I speak to you and and do that? And that it just changed everything for me. All right. That was good. 
Was that too much about me? No, it was good. It was good. <laughs> okay, like number it. two, um, make your first impression your best impression. Uh, science tells us that people make a judgment about you in about seven seconds. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm telling whether in front of a large audience or one on one. People, you know, you're always making people feel something. And are you aware of what you make people feel? And uh, could you? on purpose, make people feel something on purpose. And I think one of my bigger lessons here was, I, I, I just said, mind your face, is that, yeah. I, you know, my wife said, you're very intimidating. I don't want to be intimidating. Well, you're a different person when you smile. Oh, okay, then yeah. maybe I should smile more. <laughs> um, I think you do this really well. When you enter a room, uh, when you uh, join up with one or, or many, you, you have a great way of uh, making a great first impression. Have you Is that uh, intentional? Have you done that on purpose? Are you studying that? Or is that just your natural charisma well i think it's <laughs> being around john for so long has just rubbed off on me you know i think about when you ask that question i mean i think around the statement that he says walk slowly through the crowd oh yeah and 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 he does that and he smiles and he shakes hands and makes eye contact and so i think just years of being um around john and watching him do this and watching him make first impressions and connect with people it's become part of a, a learned behavior of mine. And so I think that's probably where that where that comes from. And I try to do that, whether it's in a one-on-one situation or whether it's with a, a team or, or a large group. And um, I, he talks, John also talks about in 25 ways to win with people, the 30 second rule, where he says, hey, basically within the first 30 seconds of the conversation, find something about that individual that you can say that encourages them, mm. that speaks encouragement right. into them. What is that? What is that? Now, do it authentically. I'm not saying just to do it, just to make that statement, have pure motive. But I think if you keep those things in mind, my biggest problem in doing that is walking sl- slowly through the crowd. Because <laughs> sometimes I get focused, sometimes I get on an agenda, and sometimes I, I just kind of will speed walk through. And I had a friend of mine several years ago who actually observed me doing that pulled me aside a couple days later and said man you must have a lot going on and i was like why he goes well i just i watched and observed you through the crowd a couple times and it was very unlike you to where you kind of had your head down and you were fast paced and didn't even acknowledge the people around you and it kind of it really struck me and Mm -hmm. it hit me and so even as busy as i am i try to still make sure and I think that's just a great way to be able to make a, a good first impression. Well, that brings up a uh, interesting because you know you and I are. Um, if you think about it, some people are task based and some people are relationship based, yeah. it's, it's a personality and temperament thing that some people are more quiet and reserved, some people are you know louder and not reserved. And that would be me and you. So it's a little easier. What, what do you think about? Uh, to me, this is a, a great one to think about. You're going to make people feel something if you are that task based, reserved, quiet person. Could you? intentionally, I like what you said about walking slowly and maybe putting my task on the back seat for a moment and, and forcing myself to be relational for a moment, yeah. to get the first impression, to let people see you, to let them experience you and to feel something positive about you before you get to the task. Yeah. It goes back to the, the old, the old uh, managing by walking around. Yeah. And even if you have a tendency and you're wired perfectly how you're wired to be a little bit more reserved, um, that just put a smile on your face. I love that. Mind, Mind your, your face. face. <laughs> Mind your face. The smile will just, yeah. it will just connect with people and have a, a good first impression. Hey, podcast listeners. Do you have a clear plan for growth? Achieving big results most often does not require big life changes. Small improvements over time compound into big results. Download the Maxwell Leadership app. It's the new free app where our expert guides and John Maxwell help you pace your leadership journey and set a clear plan for your own personal growth. You can also find all sorts of resources on the Maxwell Leadership app, including this podcast, information on upcoming events, and much more. Just search Maxwell Leadership in your app store and download the app today. There's a, also another phrase around where um, those that are listening, I won't spell it out for you, but it could be that you have a resting, you know, <laughs> pissy face. face. Yeah, yeah. I'll use a couple of other words that we've used uh, 
may or may have not used with my children as they were growing <laughs> up. But but yeah, I think that I think that's key uh, with that first impression around that smile. So, well, number three is be intentional in seeking to understand their world. Mm. When you are, man, when you're connecting with people um, and you're speaking to them, people are either thinking, man, so what? Or me too. The, the, the lesson that I really want to pull out here for me, and this is just a personal uh, lesson from our event, which we do an event every year called Exchange. And it's a fantastic event. It's two and a half days of leadership content, c- communicators and speakers, but also we try to stretch the limits and, and bring to the table some leadership experiences. Well, this is an event that I have a privilege of leading an incredible team on. And this past year, we did it out in San Diego, and we were doing some work with, with uh, our Navy SEALs out mm. there. And we thought, man, this will be awesome. We're going to have about 120 people. We're going to take them out. And let's let's let them experience on the beach what it's like to go through (laughs) all this stuff, right? (laughs) So, um, the day before, I met with John, and I said, "John, this is going to be awesome. Our team feels really good about it. I feel good about it, but we're we're still getting a lot of negative feedback. We're still getting a lot of concerns. Can I do this? And I don't want to be a part of that. And look us up. And John sat me down. He said, "Here's what I want you to do." He said, I literally want you tomorrow to get up there before we even get started in the whole day and just comfort them and say, hey, man, no, like I'm feeling the same way you're feeling. But trust me, it's all going to be OK. There's going to be a there's going to be a place for all of us to participate. And it's that whole kind of, oh, man, me, too. Like, I do not want to go do this. And it was just a great lesson because then John sat on the front row and watched me communicate that, which was <laughs> a little bit fearful. And then I afterwards said, hey, coach me on that. And it was just around, hey, put yourself in their shoes so that they are going, man, he really does understand my world. And so just that that's just a great lesson for me. So how do you do this, though? You speak to mm. bigger and larger audiences more than I do. Um, how do you do this uh, with, with the audience if there's so many people in there really trying to understand their world. Yeah, so much of this starts with before the event or before you speak. Of course, if you're speaking with one-on-one with people on your team, you should absolutely know what's going on in their life, where are they, who are they, what's their experience. You'll you'll do this as building relationship. If you're speaking to a larger group, I, I always come in uh, ahead of time with the sponsor. I ask them to bring me up to speed on who this audience is. Why are they here? What are you expecting? Uh, what's the, What have they seen before me? What are they going to see after me? Uh, what are their strengths and their struggles? W- what are they in this environment we're having right now, in this economy? What's going on? Um, what could I possibly do to add value to them? Uh, I love to arrive early, meet, touch, and talk. I talk, you know, to just greet and understand people, to shake as many hands as I mm. can, to ask some questions to uh, connect if if possible to do that. You know, Jim Rohn said, and I always thought about this, was start with people are before you try to take them where you want them to go, is that I need to know where are you? And and then I, as to me, it's kind of identifying a gap. I know I'd like to take you, but where are you? And then I can, I can teach or coach to that gap. Yeah. And that makes it easier to add value to people when doing that. Number four was be personable. Uh, are you are you likable? Uh, people don't want to listen to you if they don't like you. Um, how does one make themselves more personable? <laughs> yeah. Well, John teaches the approachability principle in uh, a book that he wrote called Winning with People. We actually have a, a development course for some of our teams around this same thing as well. And I think being at ease with yourself helps other people uh, be at ease with you. And uh, you're not trying to put on a front. You're not trying to be somebody that you're not. You're not trying to lead like Perry or you lead like Chris. You, you, you want to communicate and lead, you know, the way that you are and be at ease with that. And so when you do that, you become very real to other people mm. and, and you connect and you're, you're personal with them. Um, as I mentioned, as we talked about this earlier, I think when you understand their world, you can connect with them and you can find common ground. There's a statement that says, man, there, there's, all, there's a connection between all of us somewhere. Maybe it's only 1%, but find that 1% and then go 100% in mm-hmm. on that 1%. And when you do that, there's going to be that approachability and that connection there with each other. I was uh, with a team on Friday, and I was spending the entire day with them kind of going through the five levels of leadership. And we were doing a workshop and a training with them. 
<laughs> and one of the questions was like, all right, I mean, what if I absolutely have nothing in common and don't even want to speak to so-and-so who's on my team? And the first question I said, well, is that person in this room? Because <laughs> if it is, we might have another conversation. They're like, no, 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 no. And so we talked about this 1% principle and then go 100% in, which is what reminded me of it. All right. Well, the last one, number five, John talks about here is develop charisma. And, and some think charisma is something that you are born with or you're not. You either have it or you don't. John says this is actually a choice and that charisma is present in people who focus on others first. Oh, well, John teaches the charisma principle, again, in the winning with people, and that uh, people are interested in, uh, in people who are interested in them. And I've seen this firsthand where I was at a, a reception. My wife was there. She had wandered away. And I'm talking to three people, and I just uh, asked a question, and then they tried to ask some of me, but I turned it back to them. And I just started using some of them. I was kind of doing a little fun saying, uh, tell me more. And then what happened? Uh, what, what happened next? And I just kept uh, drawing more and more out of them. And then uh, after seven or eight minutes, my wife returned and we departed. And the guy looked at my wife and said, your husband is, is a master communicator. And so we walked a little further. She said, a master communicator. What did you do? I said, that's funny. I, I didn't do anything. I did. I hardly said a word. Um, but they did all the talking, and it's, it's amazing how people will respond when they know you, you appear that it is charisma is a choice. It's not this over the top bubble. It, it, it's really a, a connection with people that says, uh, I care about you. I said, what did I do? I was totally present. Uh, I listened to their story. I uh, it, it, it encouraged them to tell more of their story. Uh, I made them feel seen, and they credit it to me being a great communicator when I probably said seven words yeah. uh, to do that. Um, you think we do that all the time, but um, our default mode is usually about me, oh, and I have yeah. to really be intentional to focus that outward and to make that connection. Yeah, and always fight the urge to uh, one-up their uh, story or what you're hearing from them, and I love your approach of, of asking questions. Do it authentically, please. I, I, we've talked about this. I want to underline it. Do this with the right motive and, and be authentic. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember the first time in your life that you were motivated? I mean, go back, go back a while. Now, I know I was motivated before this, but I'm going to go back, if you'll let me for a moment, and, and share with you the first experience that I can remember being motivated. I'm sure there were others before then, but this one was the one that really helps me to understand the power of motivation. It's when I was in the fourth grade, and I went to my first high school basketball game. I'd never been to a basketball game before. And, you know, the band was playing and they were doing all the warm-ups. But what motivated me that evening is, is all of a sudden, right before the start of the game, they turned all the lights off. And then they put a spotlight down on the starting five. And, and with a drum in the background, they would announce the players. And the players would run out on the middle of the floor with the whole gymnasium dark, except the spotlight on that player. And the people would stand up and they would cheer. I can remember I was in the balcony. I was hanging over the railing, only as a fourth grade kid would do. I'm hanging over the railing and I'm watching these ball players run out on the basketball court. And I'm watching everybody cheer and everybody get excited about the game and about the ball players. And that evening, I can still remember how I felt. I said to myself, I'm going to learn how to play basketball. And someday, I'm going to be in this gymnasium and they're going to call my name. And I'm going to run out on the middle of the court. And I went, to, I went home that night and I told my dad, I said, Dad, I'm going to learn how to play basketball. And my daddy, you know, he, we had a little driveway there and he put up the basketball court and got me a Spalding basketball and the whole story. And I'm telling you, I'd shovel snow and I'd be out there playing when it was snowing. I mean, from that point on, I just began to play basketball and practice and work on my game. And I can remember when I got to the sixth grade, you know, you have this little fifth grade ball and sixth grade ball. I played on uh, Franklin uh, School's sixth grade basketball game. And we, in the city, we were uh, one of the two best teams. And the championship for the sixth grade basketball team in Circleville, Ohio, was to go to the Mill Street Gym and play basketball on the court where I'd seen the big boys run out for the starting lineup. And I'll never forget what I did. When we got there... All the other kids got to practicing, and I remember taking my basketball and going over and sitting there in the seat where those guys sat. And I closed my eyes. I mean, I turned all the lights of the gym off. And then I announced my name, and I dribbled the ball out to the center court. 
And it felt so good. Nobody else was paying attention. Nobody else knew what I was doing. It felt so good, I did it again. <laughs> and about the third time, the coach came over and said, John, come on, get over here and start practicing. The, you know, we're getting our warm-ups here. He said, what are you doing? And I remember looking at him just as clear as I could be. I said, I'm getting ready to play high school basketball. And we played that game, and I'll never forget as a sophomore in high school, when I looked on the locker room right before the game, and I saw the starting lineup, and I was the, uh, kind of the youngest kid on the team, and I saw my name at left guard. And all of a sudden, I realized, now, a few years later, my dream was going to come true. I'll never forget the lights going out, the spotlight coming on, me running out. The first thought I had right before I ran out is, don't trip. <laughs> But it's a beautiful story. It's just my story. It's a simple story. It's not brilliant, but it's just a story. It's a story of the power of motivation, of what happens to a person when all of a sudden they're motivated to do something that they've never done before. Now, here's what I want you to see. Are you ready to take notes? Average leaders direct the people. Good leaders direct and explain to their people Excellent leaders direct, explain, and demonstrate to their people. Now, here we are. But the great leaders direct, explain, demonstrate, and inspire their people. Vince Lombardi was exactly right when he said, Coaches who can outline plays on a blackboard are a dime a dozen. The ones who succeed are those who can get inside their players and motivate them. So let's talk for just a few minutes about the leader who motivates. Because there are some characteristics about the leader who motivates others. Number one, the leader who motivates others is self-motivated. That's a fact. I have never met a motivational leader that lacked motivation personally. They're all self-motivated. The very fact that you're self-motivated gives you the credibility to motivate somebody else. Number two, the leader who motivates should motivate others with the right motives. Again, the right motives is so essential. Manipulation, I say it so much, is moving people for personal advantage. Motivation is moving people for mutual advantage. (laughs) So there are some motivational questions you have to ask yourself. This is a great question. Do I only motivate people who can help me? That's a great question. Do I only motivate people when I am in a leadership assignment? Do I motivate others by using leverage or guilt? Do I unconditionally love others if they do not respond to my motivation? Just some great questions to ask. Let me just stop here for a moment to say in the area of motivating people, Because all my life I've tried to stretch people. There has to be a a, a certain amount of integrity in your motivation, and let me explain that. I always want to motivate people out of their comfort zone, but I try never to motivate people out of their gift zone. And you really need to understand the difference between that. All you do is frustrate and hurt people when you motivate people out of the gift zone you got to always play to where their strengths are. Now, you always are motivating them out of their comfort zone. But if a person can't sing, don't motivate them to sing. Don't do that to them. It's not fair to them. It's not fair to the people they're going to try to sing to. Does that make sense? Number three, a leader who motivates creates a motivational environment. I'm from the book, Coaching for Improved Work Performance. There are five reasons why people do not perform the way they should. Number one, they do not know what they are supposed to do. And beside that, put the fact that is a mission issue. In other words, nobody's ever declared what the mission is. Nobody's ever laid out the vision. They do not know what they're supposed to do. The second reason people do not perform as they should is they do not know how to do it. That's a training issue. Nobody's ever sat down and trained them how to do it. Or number three, they do not know why they should do it. That's a soul issue. 
Or number four, there are obstacles beyond their control. That's a leadership issue. It's what leaders do. Help remove the obstacles and clear the path for people to follow. Or number five, they do not care enough to do excellent work, and that's an attitude issue. Motivation is like love and happiness. It's a byproduct. When you're actively engaged in doing something, it sneaks up and zaps you when you least expect it. As Harvard psychologist Jerome Brewer says, you're more likely to act yourself into feeling than to feel yourself into action. So act. Whatever it is that you know you should do, do it. In other words, go from hype to habits because we overestimate the event and we underestimate the process. Get motivated and go do it. Podcast family, before we jump back into today's content, let's talk about time. I want you to think about the tasks that steal your time. You know, the things that keep you busy, but aren't necessarily the best use of your time or the most productive. Maybe it's inbox management. Maybe it's managing your calendar like me. Maybe it's processing payroll. Now, what if I told you that delegating those tasks, saying no to those tasks, could help you reclaim an average of 15 hours every week? That would allow you to say yes to the things you love, the things you're good at, the things you should be spending your time doing. Sound too good to be true? It's not. All it takes is focusing on your strengths and delegating your weaknesses. That's where our friends at Belay can help. Belay has been helping busy people do just that with their U.S.-based virtual assistant accounting, social media, and website staffing solutions for over a decade now. And to help you get started, Belay is offering an exclusive VIP promotion to our Maxwell Leadership podcast listeners. To claim this offer, just text Maxwell to 55123. That's M-A-X-W-E-L-L to 55123. Get out of the administrative weeds and back to casting vision for your next big thing with Belay. I'm sitting here today uh, with Tracy, and Tracy, I, I thought about a quote from Patrick Hem- Emmington. He said, it's the greatest folly to talk of motivating anybody. The real key is to help others unlock and direct their deepest motivators. And as I'm listening to John today, I thought, how true is it that if you'll just listen to this as that student we talk about? Yeah. Yeah. Man, there's really some good stuff here on how to motivate yourself and then motivate those around us. And I agree. And what I think is so cute, let's bookend it. I'll start at the end and come back to the beginning. Um, when John says, go from hype to habit, yes. I thought it was so cute, the story that he started out talking about himself as a fourth grader and how amazing that when he saw the big boys, as he called them, out on the on the court. I would think that most kids, now I've I've had six kids, and I would say that most kids, including myself, would see the people out on the court and would practice being in like by being um called out onto the court by by the microphone and the to the crowd cheering. And what he saw, even as a fourth grader, was that he needed to that was the hype. Mm. The being interviewed or called out onto the court. It's not interviewed. What is it? Being introduced. Introduced, out the, yeah. Introduced out onto the court. And what he saw was that he didn't need to practice being introduced onto the court. Even as a young boy, he saw that it wasn't about the hype he needed to practice. He needed to practice basketball so that he could be one of those five introduced out onto the court. I thought that was amazing that even as a child, he wasn't drawn to the hype, even though his heart was. He was drawn to the habit that would get him to that position where he would be introduced. It, I thought it, that's amazing. Yeah, that whole comment and then how your play on that um, reminds me of a great story of Serena Williams, the great tennis star. Mm-hmm. Um, and she would, right before championship games, she would start thinking about the post-game interview and what she was going to say. She would start envisioning what she would do right after the last shot when she mm-hmm. won the championship. Isn't it interesting, and John's thinking about walking out on that stage and he dribbled out there and then came back, did it three times. The coach said, are you going to (laughs) practice? 
<laughs> and and so, but these great, it's almost like don't mm-hmm. focus on the pomp and the hype as you're talking right. about. Focus on the talent, but then focus on how you're going to make the best That's once right. you are really talented. Yeah. And uh, I, I love that. I, and I think that both of those stories just really motivate me how John did that and then how Serena would spend I time agree. thinking about what is going to be her post championship interview and how is it going to sound even before she's played in the championship. So I love that. And that's that's kind of, I think that's applicable to how we as leaders need to be. We need to focus on the disciplines, the habits, and not so much on the hype. That's right. And preparing to succeed. Yeah. And so I would love to know, I'm sure our listeners would too, do you remember the first time you were motivated? Yeah, I... Uh, I was real motivated, and it, it goes to John's first point, the leader, leader who motivates is self-motivated. I can remember, Tracy, um, four and five years old, leading, I, I told, I'm, all of 2022, I've been telling a story in all of our big events about how I wanted to drive a ship as a five-year-old, and I would pretend my entire carport was this ship and all these people, and we were taking a cargo that was precious to faraway places, to people who did not experience the magnitude of the precious cargo that I have. Don't ask Mm. me what the cargo was. I can't remember. I just know it was very precious. It was very needed, (laughs) and it was going to impact people when I got there. Maybe it was little Hot Wheels or something (laughs) back. (laughs) Yeah, it might have been. It could have even been one of those little red hot things, uh, fireballs. It could have been fireballs. I don't know. Yeah, candy. (laughs) But all I know is I would sit on that imaginary ship and I would motivate my people saying, hey, I know we've been on the on the waters for three weeks now, but imagine the face of the people. I can remember at five, six years old, motivating my imaginary crew with what it was going to be like to deliver our cargo. Mm. So I, I can remember feeling motivated at a very, very young age, mm-hmm. I can remember motivating people, even imaginary people. Probably, invo- I probably motivated imaginary people a little bit better than real people. Um, it's easier. It is easier. <laughs> Less resistance for sure. Um, but I, I can remember early, early in life being motivated, and and mm-hmm. a lot of that came from within. I just had this passion within me that burned and and exhibited itself as motivation. And I, I can mm-hmm. remember at after about two years of driving this big cargo ship, which was our carpo, carport. This is imaginary, or this, this is all real? imaginary. Oh, okay. Driving <laughs> driving like... our carport, which was my cargo ship. <laughs> and one day I'm standing on the railing, looking out over a 20 foot drop. And all of a sudden, a plane landing at Atlanta Airport flew over, and I went, why would I drive a cargo ship when I could drive an airplane, <laughs> an airship, and get there much faster and take a lot more people? Uh-huh. So it quit being such a precious cargo to now getting people farther than they'd ever been faster until about nine, and then the mm. United States had the space shuttle program. Mm. And my cargo ship turned to an airship, an airplane, to a spaceship. And I soared into the world and took people to destinations oh, they had never been. I love been. that. And, uh, and so anyway, it's funny because I, I could tell more of the story. But today I'm not driving a cargo ship, an airship, or a spaceship, but I'm driving a leadership. Yeah. Hey! How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. Oh, my gosh. Why we love you times a million. I love that. Um, okay, so getting back to, so you're self-motivated. We're, that's the goal. John talks about the leader who motivates is self-motivated. But then he talked about something um, that we should motivate someone with the right motives. And so can you do a little bit of motivating right here to our audience? If someone is listening, he gave two examples, that manipulation is moving people forward for personal advantage. And I would say that that's a temptation for every leader because every leader is trying to get ahead, trying to has personal goals and has their eye on certain goals. Um, But then he says motivation is moving people forward for mutual advantage. So let's say someone is in our audience, and I'm certain that this has to be if we're getting real with ourselves as leaders should be. And and you might, they might have heard John say that. And there was that little bit of 
oh, in their spirit of like, it is kind of one-sided. I, maybe I am guilty of manipulating my people, not with bad intentions even maybe, but can you talk a little bit to our audience if they are, have found themselves that it's one-sided maybe, and how do they move from, move that needle from it being just about personal advantage of how do you become a leader who makes it a win-win situation? Yeah, I, I think all of us that are leading things bigger than us, things that are more significant us, mm -hmm. um, we have manipulated people. So I want to start there because it sounds so bad. And But I want to tell you this. If you're asking the question, how can I not manipulate people? How, how can I make sure that I'm motivating people? You don't have a manipulation problem. You have a passion problem. And you don't have people around you that can speak into your blind spots. Mm. Because all of us that are leading will at times get so focused on our agenda, on our mission, on the thing that is so important to us that without even knowing it, without being intentional about it, we will begin to manipulate people to get to the accomplishment of our vision mm -hmm. and mission. So start there. There's a chance, those of you that are leading big things, leading teams, there's a chance that you might be manipulating right now. I'm not challenged with the fact that people manipulate. I'm challenged with the people that manipulate ongoing, consistent, and don't have checks and balances in their life. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to manipulate people. I hope I never do, but I do. Mm -hmm. Because the agenda sometimes becomes so important that I got to get there that I don't slow down and motivate. Now, let me explain motivation. When John says motivation is moving people for mutual advantage, mm -hmm. the only way I can know what mutual advantage is, is with questions. Right. Now, John goes right after that motivational questions in, in his lesson, but, but stop right here. Manipulation, we all have a strong temptation to manipulate people at certain times when we got to get the, to the goal. We've got to get to the summit. Mm -hmm. But the way that you motivate people is you have to ask questions. You have to sit down and ask, what is motivating to you? Right. And let me tell you how you know you are being tempted to motivate or to manipulate rather than motivate when you're doing a lot more talking rather than mm -hmm. asking questions. Mm -hmm. How does that make you feel, Tracy, that we're going to go chase this agenda, that we're going to go get uh, 100,000 people in, in, the, um, in the growth app? How does that make you feel? Oh, it feels good. It feels good. Sometimes I got to slow down and say, why does it make you feel good, Tracy? Mm -hmm. Well, I know that answer for you, I think. Let me try it for a moment. You are so passionate about women that are great moms and great leaders and have a passion for the world to embrace both expressions. Mm -hmm. You're passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And you want, you want people that are passionate about family and people that have enough significance to be passionate about the family that they are significant in other areas too. Mm -hmm. So when I feel like I am over motivating you for my agenda, I slow down and say, Tracy, you do remember that on the personal growth app, you're going to be able to talk to more people about making relationships important mm -hmm. in their life. And all of a sudden I watch those lights turn back on in your eyes. Right. I watch you lean forward again and say, this is what I want my life to be about. Mm -hmm. Too many leaders that are casting too much vision, they cross the line between motivating people to mutual Mm -hmm. passions, mm -hmm. mutual accomplishments to motive, uh, to manipulating people to their passion and their accomplishments. And so for me, as a leader that is very passionate, we just talked about that with my five-year-old self, <laughs> I've got to slow down and ask questions to make sure that people are getting motivated at their passion and desire level, not my passion and desire level. Mm -hmm. It really is coming back to the relationship. It is. Which I love to always connect back to. It's it's knowing your people. It's you know that about me. You're able to say those things because you know that about me. And you also can know that I can lose motivation as somebody who you are leading into a new place because I can get distracted by other things in life and it's connecting back of where we're going to the heart of what really matters to me and what matters to the people. And I know somebody needs to hear that because you can start to feel, and maybe you feel this way sometimes, that the people that you're leading and trying to motivate get distracted easily. And so it's a matter of 
connecting back because life is busy. Life has hardships. Life can distract our people. And when we're trying to motivate them, we need to make sure that we are connecting to the things that, through those questions that really matter to them. Well, so recently sitting in uh, the studio today is Jared Cagle. He's recently been named our executive vice president of content development. Yay! And so um, he texted me earlier this week at the podcast recording and he said, uh, Mark, I'm living my best life. Mm. He said, I just experienced a day that I could have only dreamt would have happened in my life. It was a perfect day. It had all these components. In fact, he was telling us a little bit about some of the components before we started recording. Here's my point. When you are motivating people and you're getting their best, an agenda of the leader can be accomplished, mm. but it is much more gratifying as a leader to know that it's being accomplished on, in this case, Jared's terms rather than my terms. Mm -hmm. And I, I've left too many meetings, Tracy, and John Maxwell would say, hey, how was the meeting? I go, man, it was great. How do you know it was great? Because I really delivered my message. Anyway, <laughs> that's what made the meeting great. You got the message off your chest. A great meeting is when I deliver a message that awakens something in the person listening to the message and inspires them to go chase fulfillment of significance and success in their life because it's something they want to do. A great meeting is not always everybody rallying around mm -hmm. my vision and my direction, mm -hmm. but a great meeting is always when I can rally people around what's in them and what they want to accomplish with their life. And that leads right into creating a motivational environment, a motivational meeting environment. But how do you gauge that? Like for that meeting when, when John would say to you, well, how great was your meeting, Mark, or how was your meeting, Mark? How do you gauge if they, if they were sparked, if the people sitting in your meeting were sparked, if they were motivated by what you were saying and connecting with that, how do you gauge that? Well, it's a good question. Um, I love this question. In fact, I'm thinking of a, a meeting that's coming up pretty soon to where I really have got to motivate our team for the vision that I have for the rest of 2022 and getting us ready for 2023. I'm starting to feel the intensity now. It's middle of October. I'm starting to feel the intensity of 2023 plans. And um, I've really got to motivate our team. What I've asked them to do, I just shot a video this morning before I came into um, this to, to record with you. I asked them to consider, I gave them an example of what success looked like from an event that we did with the vision we had for the event and for the organization. I said, here is the model of perfect scenario. Give them a picture mm -hmm. of what success looks like. Mm -hmm. Then I asked them and I said, I want you to come ready to this next meeting with clarity on how you can learn from this picture perfect example that I've just given you mm -hmm. and apply that to some areas that you are already connected with the vision or areas in your organization that you're part of the organization that you need to connect to the vision. Find what's going well or find something that we really need to work on. I think oftentimes we ask people, why aren't you motivated? But we don't give them a picture of what motivation or inspiration looks like. Mm -hmm. I think you've got to give a good model, mm -hmm. a good example, and then ask them the question, what will motivate and inspire you to get to that good example in your world? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm trying that now, Tracy. Um, maybe we'll come back in a podcast next month or in a couple of weeks, and I'll tell you how it's going. But that's what I'm trying to do currently is create this motivational environment by saying, hey, this is what's working perfect to the vision with great culture and great momentum. Mm -hmm. This is what I would like for your part of the organization. How can you get there? What would it look like in your mind to get there? Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results. 